highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Good morning. Are we enjoying the rain? Yes. Are we? Uh, Today we are. Are we really enjoying the rain? There was a couple sunny days. So it's June, right? So is that when does summer officially start? So we have three more weeks of winter. Oh. Oh, it's spring. Yes. Okay. Oh. Yep. <laughs> My. The good news is, if you ride a motorcycle in the rain, you get your your bike washed at the same time. So. And your hair and everything else. Let's go before the Lord. Invite Him to be here with us this morning. Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for an opportunity to praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on your church. Lord, we thank you for the promise that, uh, that you gave your disciples that uh, it was good that you go away because then the Holy Spirit would come, guide, and lead. And so I, I just pray we remember that. We remember that on, uh, on Pentecost. We remember the gift of your Spirit, the empowerment that you give us. And Lord, I pray you be glorified and magnified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us? Let's praise the Lord. Who breaks the power? Of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the holder with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. King of the King. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. Set 
free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes an orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice. Shine like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be saved. sing for all that you've done for me worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. For me. Father God, we just, uh, we thank you. Thank you for your grace poured out. Uh, Lord, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that we can be gathered here and we ask you be glorified in this place, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, before you have a seat, find someone you know or someone you don't. Give them a hug. Welcome them here this morning. Oh, so I have a big line of people up here for announcements. 
Not really. Uh, so I, let me give you a plug for family camp. So family camp is coming up. We're going to be up in uh, the area of Stanley at uh, Elk Meadows, uh, which is how far is it outside of Stanley? Like seven miles? Seven miles outside of Stanley, uh, like you're, if you're heading toward Bo Boise. Um, it is a beautiful spot, and so we hope, uh, we hope you guys will sign up and come out. Uh, there is, you, you probably want to look, I think my wife put together a, a list of things you'll want to think about, like if you're in a tent, how to stay warm. Um, but worst case, if you're in a tent and you're cold, you can come knock on my trailer. It'll be the one with the heater running. And you came, you're welcome to bring your sleeping bag in. There'll be plenty of space so you guys can uh, feel, feel a little warmer. And my trailer has a, a fireplace in it, so it probably won't be on. But if you come to stay in my trailer, I'll turn it on for you so you can be warm, okay? Uh, if you are tough, because there's a lot of tough people out there, you won't need any of that. Just uh, bring your tent and come on out. There's uh, several churches that are going to be joining us. So we'll have uh, a different event going on throughout the week. So there'll be uh, different tournaments. I think we're going to have archery, uh, uh, 3D archery shoot set up up there. If you like archery, you can come uh, and, and shoot. Also have, uh, what's that beanbag thing? What do they call it? Cornhole? cornhole? We got some cornhole. I heard there was a chance of a cornhole tournament if you're one of those amazing cornhole guys. You just want to sit in a circle and chat and take it easy. Um, that's probably where I'll be so you can uh, join us around the circuit, uh, circle. And then as long as permits are, everything's good with our permits and all for fire, we'll have a worship around the fire uh, every night. So, um, so anyways, I hope you guys will come be a part of that with us. Uh, it's a good time to just get to know one another and spend some time together. Um, no, I didn't say the dates because I can't remember them. Like during June. Last weekend in June. 20 through the 27th. Last week before 4th of July. So it's officially summer because it's after the 21st. So it'll be Stanley. I will not snow. Oh, no. I probably should not have said that. Uh, well, God is good. Whatever he gives us, it'll be what we need. Amen. All right, well, let's go before the Lord and uh, ask him, pray for our, for our nation. Uh, last week, we had a focus in prayer uh, to uh, asking folks to pray for the military. Uh, this week, as we go through this week, uh, our focus this week is uh, just to be praying, uh, since it's Pentecost Sunday, praying that the church would be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit in regards to uh, the stances that the church ought to be taking um, moving forward, that the church would be led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to make an impact on our nation. So if you guys would pray for that throughout the week, that would be awesome. Let's go before the Lord. Father God, we, we come to you, Lord, another, uh, another week of, of highlights on the news that, uh, that should cause us to repent. Lord, we pray, God, that you would uh, just move among your people by the power of the Spirit, Lord. Uh, Ezekiel tells us that the Lord looked for someone to stand in the gap and marveled that he found no one. And then the Lord says, so I lifted my arm, for I am mighty to save. And so Ezekiel sees the promise of the provision of salvation being made by God himself. And we're, we're post-cross. We look back to the cross and we remember the, the, the beauty of what Christ has accomplished for us. And then the promise that he would give us his spirit that would empower us to be the men and women we need to be for such a time as this. And I know a lot of, a lot of churches and a lot of times throughout history have had to stand in turbulent times. And as we see our own turbulence, Lord, I just, um, I'm praying that we would be found faithful. Faithful to stand, faithful to pray, faithful to 
be who you've called us to be. That we could uh, call a world to hear uh, her Savior saying, come follow me. To lay down our own authority and take up the authority of Christ that we follow him and what he has uh, told us what he has taught and Lord I pray that uh, you would empower your church still today to be who you're asking her to be empower us individually to walk out our faith practically in the world empower us corporately to understand how we can best serve our communities and our neighborhoods and our families in ways that would glorify you and honor you. God, we would so love to see a revival pour across this land, hearts and eyes turn toward you. So, Lord, we just uh, we, we seek your blessing and your touch. We pray, Lord, that you would guide the leadership of our nation. Uh, Lord, that your, you have never left a king or a president without the man of God calling for something different. So I pray for whoever that person is, for Congress, for our president, for, for the people in power. And I pray, Lord, you make that man strong like the Old Testament prophets could stand up and say what needs to be said and that you would call continually through your word for uh, our repentance as a nation and that we as your church would be quick to offer it so lord we uh we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from every fear those who look on him are radiant they'll never be ashamed they'll never be ashamed this poor man Lord, every day and night, never ending 
This morning we have opportunity to receive the Lord's Supper, so if you guys would please be seated. <clears throat> Calvary Chapel Buell, the only requirement that we have for participating in communion is uh, the, the, the guidelines the scripture gives us. that We are to be believers in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Paul gave us instruction. And so we'll read those in a moment. As the ushers pass out the, the, the bread and the cup, I just invite you to take the bread, take the cup, hold on to it, and we will partake of it together. Here's what Paul wrote. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. And he gives us this instruction. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And then he tells us what to do about that. How do we take communion worthy in a worthy manner? This is what he says. He says, so let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats or drinks without discerning, Without taking the time. Remember, Jesus told us in our relationships, if you come to the altar and there remember an issue, lay your gift at the altar and, and be made right before you offer that offering. Now, when we come to the Lord's table, we want to have a time of reflection so we can ask the Lord to examine our hearts. And then if there's things we need to confess, confess those things. The Bible tells in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can be made right with God, and then we will be able to partake together. So we're going to worship as, uh, as the bread and the cup are passed, and then afterwards we will uh, partake together of body and the blood of our Savior.
Let's take, uh, let's take the bread and pray over the bread. It's interesting because Scripture tells us that he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. And if you don't understand the Passover meal, you don't understand that for a thousand years they didn't know what this part of the ceremony was. They had a napkin called the unity. And in that napkin, it held three matzahs. And people would ask, because that's what Passover was all about, what are these three matzahs? What do they represent? And some would say it's the scriptures. It's the, the law and the prophets and the writings. But then they would say, well, why do you take the middle one out and break it? Till this dinner when Jesus took the middle piece out and he said this is my body broken for you so in the unity you have the father the son and the holy spirit and the son came to earth to be broken so that we might be made whole so Jesus took that the other piece after they break it they wrap it in cloth and hide it. It's called the afikomen, that which will come later. And later in the meal, the children go find it, and the afikomen is resurrected, and they take communion. Well, that's not what they call it, but that's what they do. They take of the cup and of the bread. The Bible tells in Isaiah 53 that he bore our iniquity. He who was never broken took my brokenness upon himself that I could be made whole. Lord God, we thank you for your body broken for me. Thank you for what you have provided, what you have done, the beauty that Scripture holds one story, God's redemption of men. So, Lord, we take this bread and we have broke it in remembrance of you, and in remembrance of you, we will partake together. For unless you are a part of us, we have no part of you. So, Lord, we do this in remembrance of you, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. The Bible also tells us that he took the cup after supper. There's four cups in Passover. He took the third cup. It's the cup of redemption. And he said, the cup of redemption is my blood shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And so Jesus makes that proclamation. Now, when he finishes the meal, you realize he said, he left the Passover meal unfinished. He said, I won't drink the last cup. You know what the last cup is called? That's the cup of praise. He said, I'll drink that together with you in the kingdom. There will be a day when we will finish that Passover, that last supper. We'll finish it with Jesus. You know what it's called? The marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord God, we thank you. We praise you for your redemption. That though my sins were as scarlet, the sacrifice you gave, your blood makes me whiter than snow. So, Lord, we gather together as a body of believers professing and proclaiming you as our Lord and Savior, that you became broken, that I might be whole, that your blood 
has washed me whiter than snow. And we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake together. Bible tells us we're going to do that until we do it together with him. Anybody else looking forward to that day? Between now and then, there's one thing I know. I need Jesus more than I need anything else.
Jesus, God, we thank you that you are our Savior, our first love. Jesus, our resurrection in life. And I just thank you, Lord, that we get to reflect on you, this communion. And God, just to get to surrender afresh to you and just check our hearts. Um, Lord, just search us and know our hearts and see if there is anything wicked in us and just lead us to repentance and everlasting life through you. God, we are so thankful for your mercy. And I pray, Lord, that as we dig into your scripture, God, that you would soften our hearts um, and open our hearts, open our minds to just cling to you further. Jesus, we love you and we give you this time. Amen. Good morning, church. This morning we're going to read Matthew 8, all of Matthew 8. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant has healed it at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And the scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds of the sea obey him? And when he came to the other side of the country of the Gardenians, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from him. 
And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everyone especially what had happened and the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Uh, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this day, and Lord, the opportunity that we can to meet and, and go over your word, Lord, and I just thank you for the simple things like a warm building that keeps us dry and, and somewhere that we can meet and have fellowship and, and gather as Christians. Lord, uh, from lepers to acne, you can cover it all, and you're willing to cover it all. Lord, I just ask that you watch over the kids as they go back to the uh, Sunday school. Lord, watch over the teachers, and we just thank you for all your many blessings. Say it in your name. Amen. Yeah, kids are released. Don't Jerry got a great voice? I just want him to end every time by saying, and we'll leave the light on for you. <laughs> no, he don't sell like the Motel 6 guy? Only us old people will get that because everybody else is like, Motel what? Yes, they called it Motel 6 because it used to cost six bucks. Yeah, none of you youngsters know that, right? You can't get a motel for six bucks no more. Not even a Motel 6. They should change it to Motel 69.99. I shouldn't give them the commercial, but I had to stay in Vegas one time. So I thought, all right, we'll go to Motel 6. You know how much Motel 6 is in Vegas? 300 bucks. For Motel, the roaches were free. Lord have mercy. I digress. None of that has anything to do with anything we're about to do. So, <clears throat> just Jerry's great voice. Hey, if we're gonna we're gonna look at, I told you last time in Matthew chapter eight and nine, we're gonna be looking at a series of three events, uh, series of threes. So last time we had three healings. This time we have three other events. Next time we'll have three more. And I, and I shared with you the idea that Matthew could have chose anything you wanted to choose, right? But he specifically chose these things. He chose these things to highlight, these healings last time. If you remember last time when we talked, I said one of the reasons why I believe Matthew chose those specific healings was they show that Jesus Christ is able to transform your life because he is holy he can touch you and make that which is unclean, clean. And the whole point about being a, 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 a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of the Lord, is recognizing his ability to transform my life, to change me from the inside out. He does that. That's not something that we do. Now, the second half of Matthew chapter 8, we're going to be focusing in on verse 18 through 34. And this is what does it mean to follow Jesus? These specific um, miracles or, or stories that Matthew lays out for us are going to deal on what it means to follow Jesus. He said throughout scripture, come and follow me, right? We see this picture all the way back in the beginning, the, um, in Deuteronomy, we see the, the children of Israel gathered and the priests on two mountains giving the blessings and the cursings, you remember? And the Lord laying out before them, look, see, today I have set before you blessing and cursing, life and death. Then what did he say? Choose life. There's two paths you can take in life. One leads to destruction. One leads to life. Jesus says one path is dark, the other path is light. One path is the path of the fool, the other is the path of the wise. 
so we won't miss it, he put street signs <coughs> out for us. They say, come follow me. The narrow way, remember? Not the broad path. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? So we look in verse 18, and we see at least a part of this laid out for us, and that is our future is uh, decided differently. Our future is decided by his plans and not our own. Look at verse 18. Now when the Lord saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And a lot of people have a lot of ideas about what he's talking about, and none of those are my ideas. So you can listen to their sermons later. When I believe when Jesus says this, he's saying to them, the mission and ministry of Christ means you're on the move. It's your life, your focus of your life shifts. It's not about what is mine, where's my house, where's my home, where do I stay? It is a, a ministry that keeps his people on everybody who followed Jesus. Think of those 12 disciples. They're not going to be marked by their home. They're going to be marked by where they go to share the gospel, right? Their feet are always moving. So Jesus says to this scribe, one, we want to trust in God's provision. We want to understand that God will provide for us. So while he may call me here or there, my, while he may move me from, uh, a thriving ministry in one place to, an, to another place to thrive in ministry again, that is God's, um, that's God's part, right? Our part is to trust and obey. It's not about where are you going to be? How are you going to, how, I can't, I can't make that work, Lord. When Kathy and I got the call to come to Idaho, it was 2009. For those of you who were alive back then, 2009 was a really bad year to sell a house. My house overnight went from I paid 150,000 for it in California to being worth 50,000. So and then the Lord said go to Idaho. But Lord, the market's not good right now. I don't know how to make that work. I won't, have a, I won't be able to get a place. How's that, how's that all going to happen? But that's not, those are not the questions that we ask. If the Lord calls, he opens doors, we trust his provision. Kathy and I rented in Idaho for how long? Seven years? It don't matter. It's my story. I can tell it any way I want, right? <laughs> Something like that, so, something like that, seven years. We maintained a house in California and, and hoped that we'd have good renters. And for the most part, we did. And then COVID came and somebody lived in there for free for a year and threatened to live for free for another year. So we bought him out so he would leave our house. All of those things don't matter as to whether or not you're supposed to go and serve a Lord in ministry. We trust his provision. Because if you're, following, if you're not following the Lord, then you can worry about it. Because birds have nests and fox have holes. But people who follow Jesus, they just go where he bids them go. And trust him. And just so you know, God took care of us fine. We were fine. Everything was good. The, 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 the people we rented from in the beginning were, were kind to us. We got a deal that came up later that was even better. God blessed us over and over and over. He provided for us until we were able to buy a house and sell a house in California. And that took 13 years, something like that. So, but we just put it in God's hands. What do you do if there's a guy who says, I, don't, I can't work and it's COVID, so I'm living in your house for free for a year. What do you do? I don't know. I don't know what we did. We just said, praise you the Lord. And that's not really true. I thought about. Not initially. 
Yeah. Look, I have a shady past. I still know people in that world. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't call anybody. I just, uh, I just thought about it, but I didn't do it. So I still shows the wretchedness within my heart, but. But ultimately, we trust in God's provision. And so when we're following him, we do the same. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. We can never fathom what Jesus surrenders or lays aside in the incarnation. Right? How does God become man? And the Bible tells us that he emptied himself now he doesn't empty himself of his deity he's still god we we can sit in in circles and argue about how that works but the reality is scripture tells us he's fully god and fully man but there are things there were restrictions being clothed in flesh that he didn't know before he was rich the bible tells us the richest thing in heaven god the father gave to us in jesus christ his son so he became poor so that we might become rich. The Bible says that another way, he who knew no sin became our sin sacrifice that we might become the righteousness of God. He is our provision. In Philippians 4, 9, it says, and so my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So the point is not that we must be take a vow of poverty or we must do without or we must suffer. The point is that we must trust Jesus for our provision. A follower of Jesus Christ will trust Jesus for his provision. He is the one that's supplying our needs. Remember I told you we have that idea of two paths, right? Light and dark, life and death. Um, following Jesus or following anything else. And here in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you guys know that verse, right? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and what will he do? He'll direct your path. Make your path. He'll show you where to walk, right? What does a follower of Jesus do? He trusts in the Lord. He trusts in God's provision. But he's also going to trust in God's priorities. Look at the next section, verse 21. Another of the disciples came to him and said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, we can talk about all the cultural issues about this man's father may not have been dead yet. And so he says, wait, wait until my, let me wait until my father passes and I take care of of all those family matters, and then I'll come follow you. But it, it's, it doesn't really have any relevance to the story. The point of the story is it's God's priority when you're following Jesus, not yours. It's not my, it's not my priorities. It's the Lord. Now, the Bible tells us that he who does not care for his family is worse than an unbeliever. So this scripture is, is also has to fit. It's not talking about... Uh, not taking care of your responsibilities. It's just saying your priorities shift now to God. He's the priority maker. A follower of Jesus Christ recognizes God's priority for him. We have surrendered that. We surrender all. Now, if we think about what Jesus is laying out for us about what it is to follow him, one of the things it should challenge us with is thinking about how many ways our priorities are twisted or out of whack, where our focus is not aligning with the things that the scripture tells us. And we ought to be challenged by that, not so that you can build a greater kingdom for yourself, but so that you might seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. Trust in him. Let the dead bury their own dead. There are times when the Lord's call is going to fly in the face of things that, uh, that we don't want to miss. 
The other thing that happened when Kathy and I got the call to come to Idaho is our son and daughter-in-law, who were just married, came over to our house the same night we're going to tell them that we're going to Idaho. And they said, we're having a baby. So I was really not interested in telling the part about we're going to Idaho. (laughs) Because I wanted to be there. But Kathy got to be there. There are things that priorities that shift when we choose to serve the Lord. There are things you miss. You don't miss everything. You don't miss all things. And I certainly don't want to sacrifice my children or my grandchildren on an altar called church. But I do want to serve the Lord with all my heart, all my strength, all my mind. I want to love the Lord in that way and be obedient to his direction. And where he closes the door, we let the door close and we look for the open window, right? Because God is not looking to rob you of things. And if we will follow him, I think, honestly, the way he asks us to follow him, you'll find more time, not less. But we have to have the wisdom to know that. It's God's priority. There are other times where God says, uh, you don't need to do this. Why are you doing this? Have you ever known somebody in ministry or serving the Lord in some capacity that's burning themselves on every possible side and running rampant in all these different directions? I would say to that person, are you sure God's telling you to do that? Because we we all are are we have our own hangups, don't we? We could be too focused in the other way, or too focused on the opposite. Being a follower of Jesus Christ means He's the ultimate authority, so we're following Him. Now you say, Jackie, how do I how do I know what God wants me to do? Well, let's just start with the easy one. Don't go crazy and say, I, I the you know, I, which shoe should I wear today, Lord? You don't have to start there and the subjective ideals what has God told you what do you know you're supposed to do husbands love your wives do you know you're supposed to do that okay let's start there let's just work on that let's just work on uh, loving your neighbor let's just work on being a reflection of who Jesus Christ is let's work on the ones we know instead of saying I don't know what I'm supposed to do just do the things you know you're supposed to do and we will find our surrender to God's provision and God's priorities will order our lives properly rather than seeing our lives ordered improperly because of some other drive. Does that make sense? We want to be men and women who will follow him. Now, after this, This understanding, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, my future is going to be decided by his plans, his provision, his priorities moving forward. But also, I need to know the second thing, and that is this. Your fear will be defeated by his peace. Look, he says in verse 23, And when they got into the boat, the disciples followed him, and behold, there, was a, there arose a great storm on the sea, <clears throat> so that the boat was being swamp, swamped by the waves. But he, Jesus, was asleep. You ever felt like the Lord was sleeping while you were perishing? Your fear will be defeated by his peace. Does, does the Bible tell us there's never going to arise anything that we won't be afraid of? No, mostly it says the opposite. Like I think it's 366 times the Bible says don't be afraid. That's so we could cover leap year. So you have one for every day of the year. Every day of the year we want to be reminded, hey, don't be afraid. How many of us have something right now, you don't have to tell anybody what it is, that you're afraid of right now? 
right? So the Lord is saying, don't be afraid. We trade our, when we follow Jesus, we trade our fear for his peace. And that is because we trust him in the storm. That's the key. I have to trust Jesus in the storm. Jonah's a great example of what not to do. So let's look at Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4 says, But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So the ship threatened to break apart. And the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled all of the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. That's not because he has the peace of the Lord. Jonah wants to die on that boat. So when he comes up, the guys say to him, what are we, we've done all these things. Maybe, maybe you know why this is happening. And Jonah says, yeah, I've been disobedient to God. He, he might be after me right now. <laughs> so he says to the guys, throw me over. Throw me out. Jonah is trying to die. He w- does not want to go to Nineveh. The point of the story is God is in control of it all. So Jonah ends up getting a, a uh, all-expense-paid trip <laughs> to Nineveh being swallowed by a fish, right? And taken to the shores of Nineveh. But his attitude changes and he chooses to do what God is asking him to do. Well, this is a storm like that. This is a storm like that. And all the disciples are crying out. And we will go through those storms. Maybe your storm sounds like uh, you have cancer. Maybe your storm sounds like your children have cancer. Maybe your storm sounds like a horrific accident or a, a difficult trial. It doesn't make any difference. It still feels like a storm, right? And you're pretty sure the waves are going to cover you over and you're going to drown in the midst of it all. And that's exactly how the disciples felt. They were crying out to God, Lord, what is going on? Look at verse 25. And so they went and woke him up and they said, save us, Lord, we're perishing. Now that's a good line to remember. And that's a great line to speak to the Lord. In the middle of our storm, save me, Lord, I'm perishing. I'm dying, I'm suffering, I'm losing it, I'm having a hard time keeping it together. God, save me. That's an honest prayer, right? That's a real prayer being laid out to the Lord. It's a desperate cry. And sometimes our desperate cries sound like, God, don't you care? Don't you care that I'm perishing? In fact, Mark, when Mark tells us about this story, Mark 4.38 says, he was in the stern asleep. Uh, on the cushion, and they woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care we're dying? Don't you care? Have you felt like that? Being a follower of Jesus Christ means we trade our storm for his peace. That's one of the things he promises us. Psalms 44, well, Psalm 10 1 says, Why, O Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself in the times of trouble? Have you felt like that? God, where are you? Psalm 44 says, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. All of those say with more words the same thing that Matthew wrote. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. This is the call of a follower of Jesus Christ from the midst of the storm. Now look what happens in verse 26. He said to them, why are you afraid? And what did he point to? O you of little faith. Why are you afraid? Is God freaked out? By our circumstance, 
No. Most of the time, the things that cause us that anxiety is uh, the idea we are looking at the circumstance apart from God. We don't see him in it. We don't see him moving on our behalf. We don't see him a part of it. But the scripture tells us he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was great calm. When we are a follower of Jesus Christ, his calm is what we need. God is not freaking out. Doesn't mean that the trial we're going through won't be difficult, won't be hard, uh, that there won't be times of suffering and, and anxiety and hurt and pain. Those things will come. All the people who tell you the, a life of a believer will never have those things in their life are lying. Those are lies. That is not found anywhere in the Bible. With the exception of one disciple, they were all put to death by a world that hated them. They all suffered. But they had the calm of God in their suffering. Because they trusted him. What you have for me, Lord, I trust you. Wherever I got to walk. I told you guys last time about that woman I went and visited. They, she had cancer in her stomach, maybe you remember. And they, they did surgery and it was everywhere. So they couldn't even close up the incision. So her stomach was wide open. And she, they just sent her home to die. And I went to go visit her to pray with her. And as I walked into the room, she said, Oh, Jackie, I'm so glad you're here. I want to pray for you. The witness that she was in, in my life of a woman who was dying horrifically was not comfortable, was not pleasant, but she still trusted in God and I saw God's calm on her. I watched my pastor's wife die of pancreatic cancer and I watched the calm of God on her life the entire time. And it was a drag. It was hard. But she trusted him. And she knew that God could say at any moment, peace be still. Can God calm the storm in you? Yeah. And you need to let him do it. You need to say the words, Lord, you need to calm the storm in me because I'm having a hard time dealing with all this stuff, the disappointment, whatever. What, whatever the storm, whatever the cause of the storm is, the calm of God is what we need. Psalm 89 verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 89 is making a declaration. It's not only talking about storms, if we're out in the ocean, he's talking about the storms of life, the waves that want to drown us, the things that discourage us, the anxiety that rises up. Anybody struggle with anxiety? So in our struggle, there are times I just sit in my office at home and I tell God to calm the storm in me because it's all raging. My stomach is all upset and my for whatever, this, that, you know, I'd love to tell you they're giant storms. They're not, any of them big, but it doesn't stop it from causing anxiety, right? When we follow the Lord, we trade our storm for his peace. We want to know that God, he is for us. It says in verse 27, when Jesus said, peace be still, and the waves stopped, it says, and the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Well, why is it that Matthew is telling us this story right on the heels of a story about following Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Because there are a lot of people who will give up on following Jesus because of the storm. They'll say, I've heard as a pastor this a thousand times. I tried that whole Jesus thing. But there are still storms. Yeah, there is. There will still be storms. 
But as a follower of Jesus Christ, I trade the storm for his peace. It doesn't stop the wind from blowing. doesn't stop the waves from rolling. It just means I have his calm. I do not have to be anxious. The Bible, in fact, says be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and make your request known to God with thanksgiving and the peace of God will rule your heart and mind. We trade the storm for the peace. What sort of man is this? This is a man who has control of all things. Is God in control? For sure. Is God in control? I will tell you, I don't believe you can mess up God's plan. If you could mess up God's plan, then I would have a hard time with him being God. So God will accomplish his purpose despite the fact that we are a bunch of knuckleheads that make it harder than it has to be. Amen? God is able. And I know God can calm any storm. And I remember, listen, when, when our youngest son Joseph was diagnosed with autism, 20, how is he, 25? So 22 years ago, we're sitting down. He's three years old. He's not talking. Some friends of ours said, hey, you might want to, uh, go, you know, have him tested, which I'm sure was a, a uncomfortable conversation <clears throat> for her. And we went and got tested. And I still remember the doctor saying, well, he's got, he's got autism. Kathy called me. I didn't even go with her. She's crying on the phone. Joe's, Joe's autistic. I'm like, what's that mean? You guys know that, uh, that autism, it used to be one in 10,000. And then around the time of our youngest son, it shifted to one in a hundred. So there's a lot of people with autism now, right? What's it mean? I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know what's it going to, I still don't know what it's going to mean. Joe, Joe will live with us forever. I hope because I'm an anxious dude and I'm not going to let him go live somewhere else. So, uh, but I remember going, okay, well, the, we'll just pray. We'll pray it out. We'll pray that he has the demon of autism. So we'll, we'll exercise the demon. So we anointed him with oil and we prayed and Joe was still autistic. And then we said, well, we'll pray for healing. God heal everything, right? And so we took him and we anointed him with oil and we prayed that God would heal him, him of autism. And we did that whole thing. We chased down every possible cure there ever was. So please don't send me an article tomorrow. I have already read them all. God is the healer, and there's no miracle cure for, for my Joe. So we, we did it all. And then there was the day where I sat before the Lord, and I was able to say, Lord, I thank you for giving me an autistic son. And all the storm was gone. Now, he's still Joe. You come to my house, you're going to hear things you don't want to hear. <laughs> Sorry. And Lord have mercy. We, <laughs> I should be quiet now. <laughs> we went over to Victor's house and we took Joe. The other thing Joe will give you is plumbing problems you didn't know you wanted to have. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what that means, I'll explain it to you later. <laughs> as far as I'm willing to go. The point is, when we're a follower of Christ, we trade the storm. Now, it doesn't mean we don't pray for healing. We don't pray for God to do the supernatural because he can do that. But we also need to know sometimes the reason the storm's there is because God brought it. And so we need to curl up next to Jesus who's in the bottom of the boat, not trying to destroy us. He's not trying to kill us. And receive the calm he has for us. Amen. Let God's calm be with you. Okay, then the last thing we want to recognize about following Jesus, verse 28. Our faith depends on his power. It says, and when he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. 
So according to Matthew, there's two. According to some of the other Gospels, there's one. And people always ask me this question. If you already have the question, feel free to bring it tomorrow. It's okay. We'll talk about it a little more in depth. But the point is there are two demon-possessed men, one of which spoke. And the one who spoke is the one that the other Gospels focus in on. And Matthew, he's just telling us the whole story of what's going on. There are two Gadarean demoniacs. They're coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one can pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of pigs was feeding at some distance and the demons begged him and said, if you cast us out, <coughs> send us to the herd of pigs. So there's some characteristics of this demon possession that we want to understand. It was violent. They were exceedingly fierce. They had unusual strength. They couldn't chain these guys down. They were breaking their chains. Mark 5 says, he lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles into pieces. Uh, no one had the strength to subdue him. We also see isolation. They were living in the tombs. There's not a lot of people doing that. They're isolated, right? They're in the tombs alone, night and day among the tombs. And on the mountains, crying out and cutting themselves with stone. They had uh, at least some measure of immodesty because they're running around naked the whole time. Self-abuse. They're cutting themselves with stones. They're harming themselves. And they are aware of the divine presence. He says, what... Have you to do with us, O Son of God? The demons who met Paul, they knew Paul, right? You guys remember the story of the sons of Sceva? The sons of Sceva come to cast out demons, and the demon says to them, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, we don't know you. They said, we come to cast you out by the by the power of Paul's Jesus, something like that. The power of Jesus whom Paul preaches, something like that. But they didn't have the power. They didn't have Jesus. The sons of Sceva were not saved. You as an unsaved individual have no power over a demon, do you? I don't have any power over a demon. It is the spirit in us that has power over a demon. And so they... They recognized, the demon recognized the divine. He was aware that Jesus was there. And then they have this unique conversation. I often get questions about it. Why did they ask to get thrown into the pigs? They're just doing what demons do. What they didn't want to do is get put in chains. Right? He said, it's not time yet. Have you come to cast us into the abuso? If you want to understand that, you read the book of 1st, 2nd Peter, read the book of Jude. Both of them talk about angels who are reserved in chains awaiting judgment. Those angels that Jude talks about, that Peter talks about, are the angels from Genesis chapter 6. If you have a different view about that, I've told you before, it's okay, I don't mind if you want to be wrong. You can be wrong. <laughs> if you want to talk about it, we can sit down and talk about it, but the Genesis 6 was an event where angels um, in some way commingled with men and their offspring were gigantes. They were giants. And so the Lord said over and over again when they were taking the land, get rid of the giants, get rid of the giants, get rid of the giants. And so those angels that were a part of that were already in the abuso. They're already in chains. They're awaiting final judgment. These demons who are fallen angels are here in, these, in this man. In fact, the Bible tells us in the other gospels that the demons, when the Lord says, who are you? They say, we are legion for we are many, right? And a legion was oh, a lot of guys. So he's got a lot of demons in him. And the Lord says to them, or they, they say to the Lord, are you going to put us in chains? 
So in lieu of putting us in chains, can we go hang out in those pigs? And for the Lord, anything outside of this guy was better than being in him. So he gives them permission. He permits. And what do they do when they get to the pigs? They drown them all because what do demons do? They destroy. What were they doing to those people's lives? They're destroying. What do demons do? Demons destroy. That's what they do. Fallen angels, what do they do? They destroy. If they are in a person's life, they are there to destroy that person's life. That's what they do. If they were in a pig, they're there to destroy the pig. That's what they do. That's what they do. But how is it that these men are, are set free? Jesus, he says to them in verse 32, go. So they went out. Uh, they came out of the man, went into the pigs. Behold, the whole herd rushed down <coughs> the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the water. And the herdsmen, rather than celebrating the two crazy guys that were demon-possessed living in the tombs that we couldn't walk by because they would come out and try to kill us. Remember those guys? Yeah, well, they're clean now because Jesus is able to transform lives, right? They're clean now. Jesus transformed their lives, but uh, we lost all the pigs for that to happen. Mankind has this weird this weird thing where we will value the creature rather than the creation. We will, we will value the creature uh, over the creator. We'll value the creature over men. And let's say I just decided I, I didn't want, oh, that's probably a bad example. This is Idaho. But let's say my dog had puppies, I didn't want them. Most people would frown on me just going out and clubbing them in the head and throwing them away, wouldn't they? You can't do that to puppies. But in Twin Falls, they do it to babies every Wednesday. They value the creature, but they don't value one another. And so the herdsmen fled. They ran into the city and told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed man. In Luke, it says, the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, <coughs> sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. It's interesting because in Luke, there's, there's so much more to this story, and I don't want to get too derailed in it, but... But in Luke, the demons asked Jesus, can we go into the pigs? Jesus says, yes. The herdsmen return and say to Jesus, will you leave? And Jesus says, yes. The demoniac comes to Jesus and says, can I go with you? And Jesus says, no. 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 Because remember when we follow Jesus, it's about his provision and his priorities, his plan, his power, his ability. You know that demoniac stayed in the area and was a witness to the people. Though Jesus was gone, he's a witness. Every time they see him, they know Jesus can transform a life. Jesus has the power to save. That demoniac, he becomes an example of all those things. It says in Matthew verse uh, 34 in chapter 8, And behold, all the city came to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave. Go away. But in Mark, we hear what Jesus told the demoniac. Mark 5, 19. He, he says to the demon-possessed, uh, demon or formerly demon-possessed man, verse 19, he said, no, he did not permit him to come with him. But he said, go home to your friends and tell them what the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. The demon-possessed man is saying, hey, I will follow you. I'm ready, man. I'll go wherever you go. And Jesus says, okay, if you're going to follow me, stay here. You be a light to them. It's God's priority. It's God's plan. It's through God's power. 
And we don't have to be afraid, right? The demon-possessed man's not afraid. He's not worried about it. Why? Because there may be a storm around him. A bunch of pigs just died. Someone might blame him, right? Someone might blame him, but he's traded the storm for the calm of the Lord. And he is going to live his days in the area of Gadara. And people will be ripe and ready for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ when they come back. Yeah? Because in the Acts of the Apostles, you'll see this area again. Hearts and lives primed and ready for the gospel of Jesus. Why? Because a demon-possessed, a couple demon-possessed guys served the Lord. They chose to follow him. They didn't worry about where they were going to put their head or what other priorities they should be about. They gave up the storm and the anxiety. They took upon them the calm of the Lord, and they were productive for the Lord. They bloomed where he planted them. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Amen? Why don't you stand with me and let's pray. Father God, we are thankful for the truth of your word and for what your word is declaring to us in the gospel of Matthew, Lord. We're, we're thankful for what we see on the pages of scripture, God, for <clears throat> reality that you are mighty to save. So God, I know that there are people here today who are in their storm and they need to trade that storm for your peace. Lord, I know that there are people today struggling with the priorities of life or uh, our possessions, the things that we have, and they need to trust in your provision and your priorities that they become theirs. It culminates as we look at this, these lives of two demon-possessed men who were hopeless Nobody's going to change them. Nobody can help them. They're just living in a tomb, causing death and destruction to those who pass by until Jesus touches them. And now they are witnesses. We all come from somewhere else, and Jesus touches us. And now we are his witnesses. And sometimes we have to be reminded that it's about his priorities and that it's about his peace and it's about his power. But if we will trust in the Lord, he will guide us. He'll lead us. He will be our provider. He will be our peace and he will be our power. So God, may we comprehend with the saints what is the height and depth and width and breadth of the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we be transformed. May we follow him. And may you be glorified through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a time of prayer again this morning. So. If you need prayer, stationed around the sanctuary, there will be people who want to pray with you. Um, if not, then we just pray the peace of the Lord be with you. God bless you till we meet again.